Good morning, church. Hello, Cornerstone. How are you doing this morning? Uh, welcome to our Sunday gathering. My name's Toby Butler, and I jointly lead the church here with my wife, Hannah. And uh, a very warm welcome to you. We've got an exciting morning this morning. We've got, we're focusing on Acts 3 as we continue our theme and looking at the gathered and scattered church over this summer. I've got some important notices in a moment that I will tell you. Um, but just to say, um, yeah, we've got Sean on worship today. Uh, we've got Hannah speaking as well. Ian's doing a reading and we're going to have some space as well. A little bit of sort of contemplation uh, question reflection space as well in the middle of the talk. So lots to look forward to. A quick couple of notices. So the first one is a really important one. As a church, we are going on a process of doing something called a mission audit. And all that means is as a body, as a church, we're giving everyone the opportunity to discern or help discern God's voice uh, for the next season or beyond for our church in reaching out and being embedded in our wonderful community. There's a specially designed survey that has gone round. So it's gone round in the newsletter and you can click on the link there to fill it in. It's also gone to those who are offline uh, to fill in and hand back. Many people have got them back to us. Thank you. If you haven't, please do. It's gone round again in the newsletter this week and you can also find it on our Facebook page as well. I put it out a few days ago. So please do click that link and answer the questions and give us your feedback as we discern uh, for this next season. That will be really good. The other thing is we've got discipleship mission groups. Um, last week I heard, and uh, not discipleship, discipleship Zoom groups, sorry, um, uh, next week. Um, and we really encouraged by how they went last week. We had well over 40 people on different discipleship Zoom groups, which is absolutely brilliant. And long um, sort of may we continue this way of at times uh, meeting together and, and chatting online when we can't perhaps all be together in small groups. The last thing to say is I'm sure you're well aware that the government uh, announced that church buildings uh, can open more uh, on uh, from from now really uh, our building work is very nearly finished which is great and as trustees and Hannah and I as church leaders we've just been working out what a potential partial opening could look like we haven't made any decisions yet we're just calmly looking at the health and safety aspects of it to make sure it's going to be a safe space for us and there's many things to consider on that front on the 10th of july we're looking to put out a plan or not a plan if it's not right to open quite yet and um, to the church so it'll be going around in the newsletter and also on our facebook page on the 10th of July. You may have questions um, so please um, do get in touch if you want to know more or you're not sure about certain aspects. We're very happy uh, to talk to you and there's also we're going to put out all the dates through till September the 6th as well so that everyone's really clear what our plan is um, as Gathered Church and Scattered Church uh, this summer but hopefully hopefully we're going to be able to uh, meet, although it will feel different, we'll be able to meet in some way very soon. Great, so that's it for notices. I'm just going to pray now and then hand over to Sean, who's going to be starting our gathering off for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you that we get to come together and, and worship you and to praise you in our homes this week. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your sustaining love for us. We praise you, Lord, for the progress we're seeing, both in our nation opening up slowly, but also in our building. And also, Lord, more importantly, the, the, the move you're doing in and amongst us, the testimonies of you speaking to each of us, the the stories of people getting more and more hungry to see your kingdom come in West Howe and beyond. Father, we just give you afresh our mornings and our days and we open ourselves now 
to you. Holy Spirit, thank you that you're, you dwell in us. And we just praise you for your goodness this morning. Amen.
in our worship this morning. May Jesus be the center. Jesus, be the center. Be my source, be my light, Jesus. Jesus, be the center. Be my hope, be my song. Be the fire in my heart, be the wind in these cells, be the reason that I live, Jesus, Jesus. my vision, be my path, be my guide, Jesus. Yes, be the fire in my heart, be the wind in these sails, be the reason that I live. my heart be the wind in these cells be the reason that I live Jesus Jesus God, as we come to offer ourselves this morning, God, would you fill us and would you move in us, be the centre of all we are and the centre of all we do, the wind in the sails of our lives, God. I ask that now, Lord, in your Holy Spirit, God, and in your name. Would you come and meet with every single one of us this morning in a new and fresh and different way as we seek to praise and, and worship and pray to you. Amen. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man, crippled from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. 
he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognised him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the beggar held hold on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us, as if, by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witness of this. By faith, in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see, I know was made strong. It is in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, my brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets, from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophet and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Hello everybody, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Thank you Ian for that reading. I'm just going to pray for us as we dive into God's word. Lord, I pray that you would give me the words to speak, your words, that we would have open hearts and minds to receive from you this morning. That what is of you would sit and stay with people. That we would allow our lives to be transformed by your word, which pierces sharper than a sword. And that anything that isn't of you or of relevance at this moment would fall away. Amen. So we're continuing our series on Acts, which is really uh, exciting. It's a fantastic um 
book of the Bible. Um, so it's my pleasure to keep going on this journey with you. So we're in Acts 3. The lame beggar is brought to the gate, the gate he always sits at. It's both his job and his identity. He is the lame beggar at the beautiful gate. People expect him to be there, lame, asking for money. In Jewish society, beggars did actually play an important role in society. They gave the people, religious people specifically, the chance to be charitable. This was a good and godly thing to do. And often if someone did give money, the beggar would then stand up and praise them in front of those around them. That was the beggar's role in life. He went there every day, carried by his friends. It was what was expected of him. And now along come Peter and John. Unbeknownst to him, they're about to change the course of his life. He asks them for money. They stop and look at him. Oh, he thinks this is a good one. They're actually engaging with me. They're not just gonna toss me some coins. Maybe they're going to give me a good amount of money. But Peter doesn't give the man what he wants in that moment. But he gives the man what he needs more than anything. The ability to walk. He is free. And he knows who has done it. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is something that Peter goes on to make abundantly clear. This was not Peter and John. They are not some kind of heroes or gods on earth. This was done in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. This man's healing only came about through faith in Jesus Christ. It was faith in Jesus that saved him. Holistic saving, the word Sousa, his body, mind and soul have been saved. As the crowd gather, Jesus points them to Jesus. That's, sorry, Peter points them to Jesus. And he makes them aware of their sins. He makes them aware that in Jesus name this man has been healed but that is the same Jesus that many of them would have been involved in condemning to death not that long ago but he also invites them to a new relationship with Jesus as we'll see in the next chapter 5,000 more people have become Christians at this point because they've heard the good news of Jesus Christ and decided to step into the reality of the promise that he gives us. But we'll look at that more in a couple of weeks time. There are a few things I want to draw out from this passage. Firstly, I want to have a, a think about those that were offering the healing. Peter and John. If you look at their actions, they were direct and to the point. They got to the heart of the matter. I imagine with the sermon from the Lord. They had faith in God and his ability to heal. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and having seen all that had been unfolding in the last few days and weeks, I imagine they were buoyed and emboldened. They had the courage to directly offer healing to this man. They don't apologise for what they don't have. They don't try to make the man more comfortable by going along with his request. But they say what they do have, healing in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. And then they stay with the man, they take his hand, they help him access his healing. I think this is really important. Sometimes, 
and I've been involved, I've been guilty of doing this myself, we're too afraid of what might not happen when we pray for healing to stay around for the consequences. Maybe we offer a prayer of healing, maybe we pray for a symptom, maybe we say bless you and we sort of hope maybe it will get better. But sometimes we're even too afraid to ask, do you notice anything different? Can you test something out? Can you try something out? Can you stand now? Because it would be embarrassing if nothing happened and we don't want to see the person hurt. We want to make the person comfortable. But Peter and John help this man to his feet. The reality would suggest that was a silly thing to do. This man had been lame from birth. How could he possibly walk? His, his ankles and his legs would have had no muscles. How, this, is, this is an impossibility. It's not like a broken leg just got healed. This man has been lame for a long time. Everything in that reality of that circumstance would suggest that he wouldn't be able to walk even with assistance. But the Bible tells us that his ankles and his legs are strengthened as Peter and John pull him to his feet. And then he goes off as his body is strengthened, leaping, walking and leaping and praising God as the song goes, which obviously now none of you will be able to get out of your heads. Peter and John literally help the man to walk out his healing. I don't know if you've heard that phrase before, but here it is in action. Walking out your healing. And this required faith on both parts. This required boldness from Peter and John. They could have said, bless you in the name of Jesus, I hope you're healed and walked away. But they engaged with him as a person. They had faith in Jesus to the extent that they were willing to pull him up to bring him to his feet, to walk out the new reality. If they had done what I know I've sometimes done, and maybe what others of us have done, is prayed a hopeful prayer, but maybe not a faith-filled prayer, and then left the person to it, to deal with it with God. Would he have been healed? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But we know he was healed with that confident declaration of faith in Jesus, in Jesus' name. And the, the fact that they lifted him to his feet to help him walk. Peter and John here are the visible expression of God's love for us and his desire to be in a relationship with him. All of us are worth being looked in the eye. The beggar probably didn't have that happen to him very often. He was probably pretty dirty and smelly and considered not very much. But Peter and John looked him in the eye and they spoke to him. And this is how Jesus acted when he was on the earth. When we pray for healing, let's do it with confidence. Absolutely in Jesus' name. And let's see each person for who they are in God's eyes. and stay around to help them walk into God's new reality for them. This healing here reminds me of Jesus healing blind Bartimaeus and brings me to my second point. So Bartimaeus apparently means son of filth. Again, not a nice name. And he probably was very dirty and smelly being a beggar. Jesus is entering Jericho and there are crowds everywhere. Bartimaeus calls out, Son of David, have mercy on me. The crowds rebuke him. Be quiet. What do you want with Jesus? 
He calls out again. He is persistent. Jesus stops. He hears Bartimaeus, maybe supernaturally, and asks the crowds to bring him forwards. The crowds wouldn't have been happy about this, but Jesus asked. So Jesus then engages with Bartimaeus. He gives him worth in front of everyone. Many of the crowd would have thought he didn't deserve it. He asks Bartimaeus what he wants. It must have been obvious. He's blind. Obviously he wants to see. And of course to Bartimaeus sight would have been very attractive, but it would also have meant that Bartimaeus would lose his job as a beggar. He would lose his role and his identity. He would no longer be blind Bartimaeus. What would his life look like? He couldn't just be a beggar without a disability. That didn't really work in those days. You, you, that wasn't a thing. Who would he be? He'd always been blind. But he would be free. And he would be saved. So he says, Lord, let me receive my sight. He recognises Jesus for who he is, Lord. And he asks him for the thing that he most needs. Even though it might cost him his identity. Jesus answers, receive your sight, your faith has saved you. And Bartimaeus was healed and begins to praise God in front of a large crowd. The glory is God's, the freedom is ours. It may seem sometimes that being vulnerable and asking for what we really need comes at a cost. But it's so worth it for the freedom that we then see in our lives. Both of these beggars lost their identity but gained a new one in Christ. Both of them would now have to work out what their lives looked like. They were probably uneducated, having been in this position from birth. They were probably unskilled, but they were both now free. Both of these beggars had to want to walk and want to see. Both of them were saved by faith, we are told. Although the lame beggar didn't actually ask to be healed, he still had to get up and walk out his healing. He could have just sat there. He could have just thought, what? You guys are crazy. That will never happen. What are you talking about? But he obviously maybe had heard of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Maybe he'd heard of some of the miracles that had been performed by Jesus even by the apostles themselves, and recognise that this could be his road to freedom. He gets up, he wants to be healed, and he goes and tests it out. It would probably have seemed ridiculous to those around him that the lame beggar was standing up and trying to walk, but he faced that opposition and went for it, in faith. He didn't worry if those around him would think he was crazy or even a fake, but he went in Jesus' name and went for the walking. He stood in opposition to his reality and he entered a new and eternal reality. What identity are you holding on to that Jesus wants to replace? Most of us need healing in some way, whether it's from past hurts, disappointments, or mental or physical healing. For too many of us, we hold on to these things and they begin to define us. We, we believe we'll never be free of this, so we may as well accept the pain and live accordingly. Perhaps we even use it to our advantage, or as an excuse for not moving forward. Oh, I, I couldn't possibly do that, you know, you know, because of my whatever it is. Uh, you know how it is. Now, I recognise that for some of you, there will be very real physical limitations. And I'm not suggesting that you injure yourself 
by putting yourself in a position that is pos physically impossible. I'm also not suggesting that you chuck away the pills that you need unless you are definitely healed. But I am suggesting that you don't sit comfortably in that place of pain. And I recognise that there are times of suffering and times of discipline, but in this instance I'm talking about things that can be healed. If you haven't asked for healing, if you haven't recognised that you are holding on to something that actually you could let go of, if it's become part of your identity that needs replacing, I would encourage you to begin that conversation with God, to ask for healing. Maybe it's past hurts that replay in your mind and that keep you trapped. Ask for healing, be vulnerable before God and before maybe one other person. Step out in faith. Within this stepping out in faith, I think that for some of us, there will be things that God has called us to. We've maybe had dreams or visions, and we know this is from the Lord, but we can't see how it could be a reality, particularly with our physical or mental or uh, limitations or our own current circumstances. I heard a brilliant talk recently uh, by uh, Bishop Jill Duff. She was talking about these prophetic dreams and visions and how seeing them come to pass often involves us living and standing in opposition to reality. If as I'm speaking you're recalling that dream or that vision that God has given you, Maybe it's been spoken over you time and again, but you're thinking, how can that be possible? I would encourage you today to step out into God's realms of possibility where the impossible becomes possible to start walking out your healing, perhaps, but also that prophetic vision that you have to start walking it out with the Lord. It's really important within this that we listen to God's voice and listen to his timing. It's not something to be rushed into, but I think that too often we limit ourselves and God by holding on to hurts or real, like actual physical hurts or mental or emotional hurts. I think we limit the things that, that God actually is calling us to do because we're letting these things get in the way when he wants to take them off them. But we need to say, God, I want you to take this away from me. I need your help. God doesn't just do stuff to us. It's a partnership. You see in both of these healings that it was a partnership. The lame beggar had to stand with faith, believing that because of Jesus he was healed. He had to react to the proclamation of healing. It was a two-way thing. And Bartimaeus had to declare in front of a large crowd that he wanted to be healed. That would have required bravery. I imagine a few people around him thought he was ridiculous and presumptuous. Why would Jesus care about him? And how on earth could he be healed anyway? We need to take steps in our healing, whatever area of life we need it in. Perhaps it's our mental health. I would really encourage that you do ask for healing for mental health. I've seen that in my own life. But I would also say that often, maybe particularly with mental health, it needs walking out. It's often a journey with God. And maybe with another person, maybe it looks like talking to a counsellor, journaling, speaking truth over yourself on a daily basis, or getting an accountability partner to cheer you on. 
but it definitely looks like taking a step forward into something that may seem impossible. I believe that healings can happen instantly and I have seen this to be the case both as uh, someone praying for the healing and as a recipient of healing. I believe there has to be a faith element uh, both from the person offering the healing and the recipient. It can be a tiny amount of faith but I think there needs to be faith there and we see that in these passages. I am not saying that if you don't get healed you don't have faith. I want to make sure you hear that today. This is not a guilt trip that if you haven't been healed, you don't have faith. I'm definitely not saying that. I am saying if you want to step out into healing, it needs faith to take that step because you need courage to do something with God that seems impossible. I've been healed of various relatively sort of small things, but also actually... Uh, something pretty big. Uh, with Reuben, and I think some of you have heard this this story before, so I'll keep it brief. With Reuben, I had um, bad pelvic girdle pain in pregnancy to the extent that in the last few months I could barely walk um, when I was pregnant. Um, I could maybe walk um, for about five minutes um, it, less than that outside the house and would often end the day crawling. Um, and uh, it was painful, but mostly it was limiting. Um, and when we thought about having another baby, we thought, well, that how on earth would we do that? Um, with How could we look after a toddler and also me be pregnant? I would not have been able to, I couldn't pick things up. I couldn't carry things. It was too painful. Um, my body just didn't let me do it. Um, so, and, and pelvic girdle pain comes back with each pregnancy. That's the pattern. It comes back each time and it nearly always gets worse. Um, that's what the medical science is. Um, I went to a conference and they were offering prayer for healing and I'd sort of said to God, well, <laughs> bet they don't offer prayer for healing for hips. They never offer prayer for healing. Anyway, the first thing they offered prayer for healing for was my hip, was hips, hips, which was odd and great. So I went up and I received prayer for healing uh, for my hips, which was where, that's your pelvis, where the pain was. Um, of course, I couldn't test this out immediately. They say, you know, test it out. Well, I can't. Um, so that next faith step for me was getting pregnant. Uh, there's no going back from that. Um, and a few weeks into the pregnancy, I noticed the, the looseness in my hips was beginning again. I was disappointed, but I had people around me praying. One person in particular texted frequently how are your hips I'm praying for you how are your hips I'm praying for you she was direct she got to the heart of the matter just like Peter and John did she helped me to walk out my healing I kept asking God I kept talking to him I kept telling myself to walk out your healing which literally looked like keep walking even when you can feel that things aren't quite going right and by 20 weeks of pregnancy, suddenly it, there was no pelvic girdle pain. My, um, I could feel my hips tightening again. My pelvis, the girdle around you, all came together, um, which was a miracle, um, an absolute miracle. That's definitely not supposed to happen. You're definitely it's supposed to get worse in, in subsequent pregnancies and worse as the pregnancy, um, at, the more it goes on in pregnancy. So that was an incredible miracle. <laughs> which also meant that I could get later on pregnant with Abby, which gave new life. So when I say that in some ways my healings have been small-ish, actually it meant that um, Abby is here with us today because uh, there's no way that if I'd have had pelvic girdle pain with two pregnancies, I would have gone for a third. I just wouldn't have been able to do it. So that's my story of healing, which was a one-time prayer to begin with, but then it was walking it out praying to God, believing for my healing and being encouraged by people around me. It was standing in opposition to the reality of medical science, not doing anything stupid. Uh, I, yeah, I, I didn't risk my health in walking it out, but keeping on going and keeping believing. I know that healing is a painful issue for many who have not seen healing, whether we are those praying or those in need of healing. I feel your pain and I long for you to be healed. 
I don't have answers for all the times that God hasn't healed. But I do know that when healing does happen, faith is required somewhere along the way. And that often it requires persistently walking the healing out with support. Healing may also involve you giving up something that is dear to you. It could be your pride, your privacy. Sometimes we're so afraid of of being hurt or being vulnerable that we don't ask for help, so we remain in that place of pain. Sometimes we justify this by saying, well, our, our ailment is just part of who we are. It's how we were made to be. Maybe if we're captives to fear, we say, oh, but I'm just a naturally cautious person. If that is holding you back from living the life of freedom that Jesus has called you to, I would thoroughly recommend starting the conversation of that healing process with him and getting someone alongside you to support you in that. Finally, for those of us praying for healing, which can be all of us, let's be direct Let's get to the heart of the issue and see God's reality for the impossible situation in front of us. Peter and John didn't offer the beggar what he wanted, but what he needed. It wasn't necessarily comfortable in that moment, but it was pretty amazing afterwards. Let's do everything out of love and a passion for seeing people saved, holistically in Jesus' name. Let's engage with the person that needs healing and not just see it as a quick prayer to walk away from in case it didn't work. Let's be bold and help the person walk out their healing. And let's use these opportunities as Peter and John did to point people to Jesus, to give God the glory. It is always Jesus that heals through us by his spirit at work in us. Let us be led by him in love and out of obedience to him. Darkness seems to 
hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Saviour's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of Yes, God, thank you that we can put our hope and our trust in you. You are the cornerstone and the foundation of our lives, God. And even in those dark places, you can light them up, God. And you light the way and the path. For Peter and John, it was the, the light in the prisons, God, and the hope in the prison. And for the man at the temple gate, God, it was a new life, not just being able to walk, God, but new life in you. God, would you fill us afresh now, God, flow into us, and would you give us new life
I'm going to sing a song now that many of you probably already know just from hearing it. But some might not, but I'm going to read the chorus to you first before we play it. It's called Waymaker. And the chorus goes, Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, and the light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Let's sing that now. If you don't feel that you can sing along, just listen to the words. Stop, 
You never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working you never stop, you never stop working Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are Yes you are, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper Light in the darkness, my God Darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. space here now. Just open your minds to God. Think about who God is to you. Is he your way maker? Is he your path and the light to the darkness in your life? Amongst us now. Let's embrace the love and the, the peace and the light that He has for you now. As we listen and we think upon His love. back to the bridge a couple more times. Even when I don't see it, you're working. How true that is. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are You are a waymaker Work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, 
That is who you are. 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 Yeah. Yeah, Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. And Father, we thank you for all we've heard today. Your incredible healing power. Your majesty, your... You make the impossible possible. And we thank you that you are working in our lives, in the lives around us, in the community around us. And thank you that everything we read about you in Acts is true. And thank you we can trust that and use that as a foundation for us to experience you and to take risks. Father, you are healer. We don't go after the healing, we go after the healer. And Lord, we just thank you for the times in the past where you've healed and we've seen that. And we praise you for the times to come. Heal our broken land, Lord. Heal the brokenness in our community. And heal the brokenness in our own lives. You are the way. Amen. Amen. Great. Thank you so much to Hannah and Sean and Ian this morning for leading us so brilliantly. And um, just a quick reminder, as I said at the start, mission audit. Uh, let's get on doing those forms. We'd love to hear and have your feedback. And the other thing is on the 10th of July, you'll be hearing more about what is or isn't happening uh, with us potentially reopening church. And a final thing just to say, we're well aware there's quite a few people waiting uh, who would like to be members and they're in that process. We were due to do it back in March, but obviously that wasn't possible. And we're still working out if there's a way to do that. Uh, when we meet together, if we meet together soon. Um, So watch this space for that. And also with baptisms as well, uh, we're putting some good thought into how that could happen uh, in the coming time. So please, if you're waiting on that stuff, which I know there's quite a few are, uh, we're very much thinking about it and hopefully we'll be able to announce something and speak more about that very soon. But bless you all. Have a good week. Enjoy your discipleship Zoom groups next week. And thank you for just being such a wonderful church and an encouraging church. And yeah, let's go after the unexpected. As Hannah was talking about, you know, let's go after healings. Let's go after the impossible with the God who makes the impossible possible. Bless you all. See you later.